This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin today's show in Venezuela, where competing pro- and anti-government rallies were held Wednesday. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro accused the United States of backing Tuesday's failed coup, led by opposition leader Juan Guaido. Speaking to a massive crowd of supporters outside the presidential palace of Miraflores, Maduro said the United States had been tricked into believing that several top Venezuelan officials were ready to break with his government. In this opportunity, the Venezuelan coup mongers fooled the American imperialists, making them believe that I was to give up, that I was going to hand myself in, and that I was to leave the country. In Washington, the National Security Council held a principals meeting on Wednesday to discuss Venezuela. The Washington Post reports the staff of National Security Advisor John Bolton clashed with a top general during the meeting for not presenting sufficient military options on Venezuela. This came as acting Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan canceled a planned overseas trip to focus on Venezuela. Meanwhile, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to urge an end to Russian involvement in Venezuela. Lavrov reportedly responded by warning the United States should not take any more aggressive steps in Venezuela. On Wednesday night, President Trump appeared on Fox Business. It's a terrible thing. People are starving. People are, are dying. There's no food. There's no water. Uh, it's just a terrible situation. You see what's going on. And we're doing everything we can do, short of, you know, the ultimate. Uh, there are people that would like to do, have us do the ultimate, but we are, uh, we are, we have a lot of options open. But when we look at what's going on there, it's, uh, it's an incredible mess. We go now to Caracas, Venezuela, where we're joined by two guests. Carlos Ron is the Venezuelan Vice Minister of Foreign Relations for North America. Edgardo Lander is a Venezuelan sociologist who's part of the Citizens Platform in Defense of the Constitution. Lander is a retired professor at Central University in Venezuela. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Let's begin with Carlos Ron. Uh, the reports in the United States were that a plane was at the ready on the tarmac um, for for President Maduro to flee Venezuela to Cuba, but he got a call from Russia that told him to stay. Can you tell us what the truth is? And if you see this as a failed coup, that's over. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, first of all, I think uh, this, uh, this version from Washington is, is ridiculous, because I think President Maduro uh, has made it clear that, that he's not uh, um, going to betray the, the will of the Venezuelan people and, and, and just leave the country uh, because uh, of U.S. Uh, pressure. Um, but also, it's, it's a wide uh, misunderstanding of, of Venezuelan politics and of Venezuelan reality to think that, you know, uh, uh, he's uh, on, ready to get on a plane, but then he, you know, he gets a call from Russia, and then that's what stops him. And I think it's just a pretext from the failed uh, uh, um, U.S. policy here. Um, what is clear is that they're, they're, the United States is clearly and blatantly uh, promoting a, a coup d'etat in, in, in Venezuela. Um, from every high-ranking official, from people in Congress like Marco Rubio, Bolton, Pompeo, etc., and, and you know, the, during the whole uh, day of, of, of the of, of the um, of the coup attempt, they were tweeting and, and and threatening the Venezuelan military and asking the Venezuelan military to join. I mean, there was there was clearly an intent. I think they have been fooled by their. Uh, um, counterparts here by, by uh, their advisors or by, by the, the people in, in, in the opposition who they speak to here uh, into believing that this is uh, an easy thing to accomplish. And then just to save face and, and, and not face the, uh, you know, the, the repercussions, they make up the story about uh, Russia and involvement or Cuban involvement and whatsoever. I mean, this is a, you know, we're, we're a government uh, run, you know, on, on behalf of, of the people of Venezuela who elected us and, and, and who uh, gave us their trust. And, and, and we're going to keep, uh, President Maduro is going to keep uh, defending his uh, position and, and the Constitution.
Well, among the many uh, statements that Trump uh, uh, administration officials have made, uh, National Security Advisor John Bolton, who's made several statements, but among them, he's publicly claimed that three key Venezuelan officials had abandoned an agreement to leave the Maduro government. On Tuesday, Bolton tweeted a video in which he named the three officials. It's particularly important now that all of you speak to those in the military and the regime who can make a difference, to Defense Minister Vladimir Padrino, to Chief Judge of the Supreme Court Mikel Moreno, and Commander of the Presidential Guard Rafael Hernandez Dalla. These are three people who agreed with Juan Guaido to transfer power from Nicolas Maduro to the interim president. They need to act. Everybody who supports freedom for Venezuela needs to tell them to act now. Victory is within your grasp. So I'd like to ask uh, Eduardo uh, uh, Lander, can you respond to that and the number of statements that have come from Trump administration officials about what's happening in uh, Venezuela and urging uh, uh, people in Venezuela to uh, follow uh, Guaido? Uh, good morning, Amy. Um, of course, I have no direct access to to judge uh, the statements, but it's obvious that this is just a continuation of this attempt by the U.S. government, by these neocons and hawks that are leading uh, U.S. foreign policy in relation to Venezuela, and that they really have no problem making up whatever story they find is convenient in order to justify their actions. Obviously, there are some people in the current administration that want a military intervention in Venezuela. They want a regime change, and they don't really need any excuse for that. They're just making up stories to justify this intervention and try to convince people within the United States try to convince people within the U.S. military that find this to be a really <clears throat> dangerous adventure, and, of course, opposition in Capitol Hill. How do you explain um, Ed, Ed, Edgardo Landers um, that it's both Democrats and Republicans that are opposing Maduro. I mean, there are many progressive Venezuelans as well um, who are extremely critical of uh, of Maduro. Uh, you have um, the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty reports that have come out. I think uh, one of the reports is titled, um, uh, let's see. Um, one of the reports being titled uh, Fear and Repression, um, Hunger at Venezuela, Hunger, Punishment and Fear, the Formula for Repression Used by Authorities Under Nicolas Maduro. Enormous frustration with the elected president, Maduro, but also the horror that the U.S. is threatening war, like this comment um, from U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo speaking on Fox Business. The president has been crystal clear and uh, uh, incredibly consistent. Uh, military action is possible. If that's what's required, that's what the United States will do. We're trying to do everything we can to avoid violence. We've asked all the parties involved not to engage in that kind of activity. We'd prefer a peaceful transition of government there, uh, where Maduro leaves and a new election is held. But the president has made clear, in the event that there comes a moment, and we'll all have to uh, make decisions about when that moment is, and the president will ultimately have to make that decision, uh, he's prepared to do that, if that's what's required. So you have uh, the reports of the National Security Council in the United States the rage of the Bolton people attacking a U.S. general for not coming up with more military options. You have Pompeo saying the U.S. is ready to go to war in Venezuela. But then you have um, Edgardo um, Lander, uh, progressives in Venezuela as well, um, saying that Maduro um, has failed in leading Venezuela, that the country is um, in, in an absolute catastrophe. Well, that's true. Uh, I'm part of a 
what could be called a critical left in Venezuela that has been quite critical of the Maduro government for some time. We think that the Maduro government has completely failed. It has led to an incredible social and humanitarian crisis in the country. We have had a collapse of the economy. The economy today is 50 percent of what it used to be just five years ago. Oil production is about a fourth of what it used to be some five, six years ago. Uh, the government has increasingly gone beyond the Constitution, and its main priority seems to remain in power no matter what. And it's obvious that we need a transition. The problem is how we have a transition. If we have the U.S. policy and the White House policy, this would mean a violent transition. This would mean civil war. This would mean a U.S. intervention. I belong to a small collective called the Citizens Platform in defense of the Constitution. And we have been arguing for some time with other groups that what we need is some form of negotiation in, that would lead to asking the Venezuelan people what they want. We are asking for a consultative referendum in which people would be given a chance to decide if they want to continue with this government, if they want to continue with the National Assembly, or if they want to open up the means to a democratic electoral transition that's defined by the Venezuelan people, not by U.S. pressure, not by U.S. sanctions, not by U.S. intervention, but a decision that should be in the hands of the Venezuelan people. Both sides claim that they have a majority. Both sides are unwilling to even start any serious talks or negotiations. And yesterday's activities, yesterday's and the day before's activities, just show the extreme to which both sides are pressing in order to avoid any negotiation. Every time there seems to be a chance of some talks that would lead to a negotiation that would look forward to a nonviolent solution, then there's a very active decision by one of the sides to blockade this possibility. I think the United States is doing everything possible to make it impossible to have a negotiation, because what they want is a rendition of Maduro, and this is simply not possible. We have a situation in which the two sides are, at, the, at this moment, forgetting politics as such. Both sides refuse to recognize the other side, and this is a warlike situation. It's a situation in which both sides attempt to exterminate the other side, and this is certainly not possible in Venezuela today. We have a confrontation between two sides that have a lot of power. On one side, one has the Maduro government. Maduro has the control of the state. It has the backing of the armed forces. And it has the backing of a sector of the popular population in Venezuela, which today is a minority. Obviously, it's a minority, but it's still there. This is something that, seen from outside Venezuela, especially from right media, uh, they simply refuse to recognize the fact that, for a certain proportion of the Venezuelan popular sectors, there's still some very active backing for the Maduro government. On the other side, we have, Maduro, we have Guaido, who has become the most popular leader in the country today. He has backing of the Today, I can say that it's a majority of the Venezuelan population. But his main strength, obviously, is not internal, but it is U.S. backing. And in this confrontation, unless there is a negotiation, there is a very, very high risk of a civil war, of very violent outcomes. And the United States, as you have said, has repeatedly insisted that the military option is on the table. So, uh, Carlos Ron, uh, you are a senior member of the Maduro government, uh, Venezuelan vice minister of foreign relations for North America. Can you respond to what uh, uh, Edgardo said and what you think explains the precipitous collapse of so many aspects of Venezuelan uh, uh, governing structures, from the economy to public services, uh, and most of this having occurred? while Maduro uh, has been in power?
Well, for sure, I have uh, I have some disagreements with with uh, Edgardo. Of course, I, I respect him, um, but but that's the whole point. I mean, we can have disagreements as Venezuelans, and that's what. Uh, this is about you know we we need to solve our differences politically and I agree in that I agree with with Ricardo through dialogue through politics and and not through violence what what we are seeing from from the side of, of Guaido and, and 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 that group of uh, of, of uh, extreme opposition leaders is is really a call for another coup and a, a call for a violent overthrow of the government and the and the invitation for United States intervention. And that's what's really more dangerous. I think uh, you know I, you see how U.S. officials are so. Uh, committed to to um, politics in Venezuela, and, and it's obvious because there, it does play into internal politics in the United States. I mean, there's a reason why uh, both both sides of the aisle uh, sort of uh, go to the Venezuela issue because they want they want the votes in Florida that they could get. Florida is a key state for the for the. 2020 election, and 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 when you have also candidates in in um, in the U.S. Uh, speaking about uh, socialism, you see uh, democratic socialism or whatever you want to you want to call it, but you you see uh, how. The uh, current administration is trying to downplay that by showing um, um, Venezuela as a, a, a sample of a, a failed uh, social experiment. What they don't take into account is that a lot of the problems that we have been having, and nobody can deny them, is the the, the effects of sanctions and and other measures taken by the United States against our government. I mean, would there there there's a financial blockade currently going on right now, where you know at least. Uh, uh, about six billion dollars are stuck in banks where we can't even make transactions to make basic purchases for food, medicine, and, and you know supplies that we need to to uh, to make the economy move forward and and, and so forth. I mean, this, this this is not this is not fake. This is a reality. It's it's so a reality that um, about last week when we were in, in uh, New York uh, with uh, in, in the United Nations, uh, the, the Department of State issued a fact sheet on their policies in Venezuela, and it was taken offline uh, the, the very next morning because as uh, the key outcomes of U.S. policy in Venezuela, they put things such as you know, Guaido being uh, interim president, uh, 3.2 million dollars being blocked in banks, and, and we, we disagree with the with the amount, but just the fact that they were saying that this is an accomplishment of U.S. policy, uh, the drop in oil production. I mean, there's a recognition that there is uh, there's an intent in U.S. policies to to hinder uh, uh, the Venezuelan government's capability of dealing with uh, national problems. You know, we're bound to have uh, economic problems. That, that that's not a that's not something heard of in in, in a developing country. But there's definitely an intent to make uh, to to weaken. Government policies to weaken uh, the government and to produce and you know take this to a, a regime change possibility. Uh, Carlos Ron, could you clarify though, uh, first of all, whether you agree with Edgardo that internally a negotiated transition is needed given uh, uh, the situation in Venezuela and Maduro's unpopularity? I mean, Edgardo said that Guaido is today uh, uh, the politician who is most popular among uh, uh, the Venezuelan people. I disagree with with the guard on that point because I believe that if he were the most popular uh, um, uh, politician in, in in Venezuela, he wouldn't need the U.S. backing to you know come out to the streets and do what what he's doing. Um, what I what I agree with him is the fact that I think. Problems of, of Venezuelans have to be solved by Venezuelans and have to be solved by, with, in politics, not with violence, not with a, uh, um, you know attempted coups. But you know we have a constitution, we have uh, means of uh, we need to you know sit down and find different different formulas to solve our, our problems. We have disagreements on how, on how we see. Uh, uh, um, I mean, I, I support President Maduro, and I believe that that, that you know our, our politics are. are the way we should go, and and he has another opinion, and I think as Venezuelans in a in a democracy, that's what you do. You have differences of opinions, and then you try to play them out. But you don't try to do this through violence, and you don't try to do this through U.S. intervention. That's 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 the key uh, point here. Whatever problems we have as Venezuelans, whatever differences, we have to work them out. First of all, amongst Venezuelans, and second of all, 
through the democratic mechanisms that they are. I'd like to talk about the U.S. media coverage of the crisis in Venezuela over the last several months. In a piece published Tuesday, the media watchdog Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, known as FAIR, found the mainstream corporate media here in the United States did not publish even one opinion piece opposing regime change in Venezuela. The FAIR piece is headlined, Zero percent of elite commentators oppose regime change in Venezuela. One example FAIR cited is a New York Times opinion piece published last month headlined, What My Fellow Liberals Don't Get About Venezuela. The video features Venezuelan-American comedian and writer Joanna Hausman. Let's go to a clip. Juan Guaido is not an American right-wing puppet leading an illegitimate coup, but a social democrat appointed by the National Assembly, the only remaining democratically elected institution left in Venezuela. Guaido's job is to ensure free and fair elections, because newsflash, the last election was not free or fair. The New York Times did not point out that Joanna's father, Ricardo Hausman, is a close ally of opposition leader Juan Guaido and was appointed by Guaido to serve as Venezuela's representative to the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, Edgardo Lander, could you talk about the media coverage and what that means? Well, it's obvious that the corporate media has been following U.S. policy, and this isn't new. I mean, it happened during the Iraq war, it's happened in Libya, it's happened in, in all over the place. Uh, the papers like the New York Times turn to be critical after the facts. Maybe 10 years from now, they'll be critical of their position in relation to what, what's happening in Venezuela. Uh, but I also think that it's important to recognize that the problems in Venezuela are not black and white. It's not an issue of the democratic government presented by Maduro and some fascist opposition. The problems are much more complicated. And I think that one has to take into account that the serious economic and humanitarian crisis in Venezuela is mainly due to the incapacity and corruption of the Maduro government. It's true that over the last two years, U.S. sanctions has become a really critical, important issue. The fact that there's a financial blockade, the fact that, the, that Venezuela has been highly dependent on oil exports and imports from the United States has that, at this moment, blockaded. The fact that, the, that Venezuela has no access to foreign credit, the fact that the central bank has been prohibited with in dealing with dollars. And there's a whole range of sanctions that is having a huge impact on the Venezuelan economy. But this has been happening mainly during the Trump administration, and this is from August 2017. But the economic crisis in Venezuela started way before that. The decay of the Venezuelan GDP, the decay of public services, the lowering of living standards, the limited access to what used to be the main achievements of the Venezuelan uh, process during the first decade are all things that were happening before the sanctions. So we have a combination of a very incompetent government, an extremely corrupt government, an increasingly authoritarian government on one side, and on the other side, we have this opposition backed by the United States with this constant threat of intervention. So we need to find a solution in which there is a possibility of, for the Venezuelan people to have a say and decide what they want for their country in a non-violent way. How do you envision that happening, Edgardo? How do you envision that happening? You have these protests in the streets right now. Uh, you have people on both sides. Uh, even if this particular coup attempt has failed, and would you say, Edgardo, it has failed, how do you see this dialogue going across the political spectrum? Even though they claim now that there was no coup attempt, obviously there was a coup attempt. Uh, Guaido himself called it a coup, a coup in process, uh, and it failed. And it just shows, 
in my perspective, that the Venezuelan population doesn't want a violent solution. It doesn't want a solution that is through a coup, through a military coup, and it does not want U.S. intervention. There's always some talks going on, always sort of on the ground, <clears throat> backstage, and every time there's something like the coup attempt this week, this attempts to have some sort of negotiation, some sort of alternative that's nonviolent, that's in the hands of Venezuelans, is once again postponed, because both sides then sort of back to their really rigid position and really try to maintain whatever power they have. It's extremely necessary to have a situation in which both sides recognize that they can't defeat the other side. There's no way that the Venezuelan government can survive till the end of the Maduro government in terms of the, his six-year period, because the economy is collapsing. People are in a really dramatic situation. It's almost four million people that have left the country. This is a, an incredible political statement. People really can't stand this situation anymore, and there has to be an alternative. Um, but this alternative can't be a coup. It can't be a U.S. intervention. It can't be violence. Uh, Carlos Aran, I wanted to ask you about the embassy right now in Washington, D.C. We're about to play a clip. We took a tour of it the other day. Activists, um, really American activists, are in charge of it right now. You, the Venezuelan government, gave them the keys. Can you explain why the Maduro government, why your government, has left the U.S. embassy in uh, Washington, D.C.? Well, we have uh, um, uh, we broke relations with with the United States on January 23rd, um, and then uh, out of the process of that, uh, we have uh, our, our diplomatic staff has left the embassy. Um, however, it is Venezuelan property; is the property of the Venezuelan state, and we have uh, allowed us as our guests uh, the, the um, a collective of, of social movements. Of, that have used the, the space to, to meet and, and, and to speak about different issues that, that of their concern. And, and because they, they, they themselves wanted to uh, also make a statement um, that uh, against uh, intervention in Venezuela and against uh, uh, the violation of, of uh, international law. Because if, um, if you recall, a few weeks ago, there was uh, a, a forceful entry into the consulate of Venezuela in New York and, be, and in two other buildings of our, of the, that are owned by the Venezuelan uh, state. Um, and they were given to uh, the representatives of, of Guaido, which is a violation of the Vienna Convention. Article 45 of the Vienna Convention says that even if two states break relations, there has to be respect uh, for the premises. There has to be uh, the premises of the mission are inviolable. So they need to well, be protected. And they were handed over uh, illegally well, uh, to, to the Venezuelan Carlos opposition. Carlos Ron, we're about to go into that embassy in a minute, uh, but we just have a minute before we lose the satellite feed. Can you tell us what is the involvement of Russia right now in Venezuela? No, oh, we have a relationship with Russia, like we have a relationship with other countries, like, such as China and, 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 and other countries that we have uh, established, uh, um, um, you know, um, uh, treaties and 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 and, and um, some you know uh, things to foment uh, promote the development in, in Venezuela. I mean, there's a the relationship is one of friendship and it's one of uh, cooperation. And that's it. This is this isn't a, uh, the way it's being portrayed by U.S. authorities as if you know uh, there's any other type of influence on the Venezuelan government. It's the people of Venezuela decide uh, through its elected leaders what what uh, what Venezuela does.
Well, we want to thank you both very much for being with us. Carlos Ron, Venezuelan Vice Minister of Foreign Relations for North America, speaking to us from Caracas, and Edgardo Lander, a sociologist um, in Venezuela, where he's part of the Citizens Platform in Defense of the Constitution, retired professor at Central University of Venezuela in Caracas. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. On Tuesday, we went down to Washington, D.C., where we met with activists who are occupying the Venezuelan embassy. The Venezuelan government has left the building, but they gave their keys to these activists. They're demanding, the activists are, that the Trump administration cancel plans to turn the embassy over to Venezuelan opposition leaders. This is Ariel Gold with Code Pink. Here we are outside the Venezuelan embassy. Tell us who you are, who you're with, and why you're here. I'm Ariel Gold, and I'm the national co-director for Code Pink. Code Pink has been here, we're going on week three, uh, since uh, April 14th, and we've been here in order to protect this embassy from takeover by Guaido, who is Trump's puppet, and Trump has been trying to, Trump and Elliot Abrams, to orchestrate a coup in Venezuela, and taking over this building how is part the, of that. How has the U.S. been involved? involved with the takeover of this building. I mean, this was the embassy. It's the embassy of the government of Venezuela. Uh, the president elected is Maduro. So what's happened here? Where are Maduro's people? Where is the government? Well, the State Department has ordered all of the Venezuelan diplomats to leave the embassy, and they did, in fact, leave the embassy. But the Venezuelan government gave us permission, and we call ourselves the Embassy Protection Collective. They gave us permission to be inside this building 24-7. Can you tell us who you are and why you're here today? My name is Kevin Zeese. I'm with Popular Resistance. I'm part of the Embassy Protection uh, Collective. We're here today because this embassy is under attack. The Secret Service has been coming around, taking pictures. I've been in contact with the State Department. They tell us they are going to, at some point, remove us. I ask them what they can charge us with, and I say we're here legally. We're not trespassing. The Venezuelan government, the elected government, allows us to be here. They gave us a key to come in. So we're lawfully here. The strange thing is, is, if the Trump administration comes in, they'll be the lawbreakers. The Vienna Convention says this is inviolate. They can't violate this embassy. They can't trespass. They can't unlawfully entry, enter. They can't give this to the opposition. That's not their role. Their job under the Vienna Convention is to protect this embassy, not to violate it. So we're here doing the job that the Trump administration should be doing. Can you take us inside the embassy? Yeah, we're walking to the back of the Venezuelan embassy, dangling from Ariel gold of Code Pink's backpack. It says, Guaido, not welcome here. We're going inside. Here is the key to the building okay. that we have, by, under permission from the Venezuelan government. Can you tell us what these—this the, is a, a is baseball, baseball jersey? jersey. Maggio Ordonez is here. Kevin, you want to explain? Alex, Alex Gonzalez. These are—they're they're, very—both Maduro and Chavez were baseball players. Baseball is a sport that's very popular. In Venezuela. So where are we going? Second floor. Kevin Zeese. I was in uh, Venezuela last May for the re-election of President Maduro. There was actually an election. Uh, he was not a dictator. Nine million people voted. Maduro received six million votes. There were more than 150 international election observers, and they unanimously came out and said that it met international standards for democracy, there was no fraud, and Maduro was legitimately elected. And comparing that to Guaido, Guaido won second place in the National Assembly election, 24 percent of the vote in the second smallest state with a tiny political party. He got in because the top two get in. Uh, and so he got in because? The top two uh, winners, the top two in the, in the race, get into the legislature. So he got in, barely got into the legislature from a tiny state with a tiny party, and then he was elevated by Trump, Trump and Pence to be the president. Uh, he, he was unknown How? by most. Well, the, the night before, well, it was a process, actually, that began in January at the OAS. They had multiple meetings to try to resolve this. Leopold Lopez was on from video conference. They've been working on this for early, it's that long. Then finally, they decided on, on Guaido as their guy. And uh, the night before that uh, Guaido self-appointed, Michael Pence called him, said, we're behind you if you do it. The, as soon as, Mike, as, soon as uh, Guaido announced, 
Trump immediately endorsed him, got the right-wing governments in Latin America and the Western European countries to do it, to join him. Why? Because the example of, of, uh, of, of an independent Venezuela is a powerful example that they don't want to see. Kevin Zeese with Popular Resistance, one of the dozens of protesters who've been occupying the Venezuelan embassy for more than two weeks. Go to democracynow.org to hear more voices from inside the Venezuelan embassy in Washington, D.C. When we come back, Britain becomes the first nation in the world to declare a climate emergency. We'll speak with George Mambio. Stay with us.